So welcome everyone to uh, Cultivating the Relationship-Driven Library. Uh, this, uh, just to, to reiterate what, what I'm sure you know from registering, um, is an online event uh, we're going to be holding uh, across the month of April 2023, uh, featuring uh, interactive sessions um, every Thursday uh, afternoon or morning, depending on your time zone. Um, featuring uh, librarians across the country uh, talking about their experiences working collaboratively with others in their communities um, to promote community health. Um, and this uh, is our event kickoff. Um, our registration will re remain live uh, throughout the month of April. So um, if you like what you hear today and want to invite some colleagues, uh, you can send them to this go.uncg.edu slash library event webpage. Um, we're hoping to, to keep building momentum around this topic, both during the month of April um, and beyond. Um, and so just to kind of uh, give us an outline of what we're going to go over today. Um, and I was telling Darlene about the golf We're going to start. So uh, five and apologize people. For that. Uh, let me go so, ahead. Sorry about that. Um, uh, we're going to start by just discussing uh, kind of what, what brings us here today. Um, uh, we'll spend a minute to uh, int or introduce our toolkit. Um, discuss how you can use that toolkit, um, and then introduce uh, the structure for the last of this uh, um, event across the month of April. So just to jump right in, before uh, I introduce myself, uh, I'd love it uh, if, if you all would feel comfortable introducing yourselves uh, in the chat. Um, uh, you can just uh, share a little bit about kind of what brings you here today. Uh, who are you? Uh, where are you? Um, and what do you hope uh, to gain or contribute? Uh, right now, we have uh, about 70 people in the Zoom room. So I'm hoping that uh, uh, you all can yeah, introduce uh, who you are um, and share that information uh, with, with your colleagues. So just take a moment to share that information uh, while I share a little bit about uh, who I am. Oh, um, excuse me, sorry, too many, too many screens here. Uh, so before, but before that though, yeah, just, just to reiterate, these are uh, from, from the registration, these are the things that we heard uh, people are interested in. Um, uh, people are de definitely interested in learning about new community partnership techniques. Um, and, and our hope is that both in this kickoff, as well as the rest of our conversations, we'll have a lot of opportunities to share what's working, what is, what is actually working in terms of um, trying to work collaboratively with others. Um, uh, we'll definitely be giving you some information and inspiration. Uh, we'll share about our toolkit um, and we'll have hopefully lots of opportunities for networking for those looking for those opportunities. Um, uh, I was really thrilled to see that uh, so many of you are interested in actually trying out uh, our toolkit. Um, so during this hour today, uh, we'll talk about how you can get involved in trying out this toolkit, uh, both immediately and then in a more structured way starting in fall of 2023. Um, at the end of April, we'll talk about next steps in terms of trying to have more regional convenings on the topic of cultivating the relationship-driven library. Um, uh, and other ways that you can share your story. Um, most of you, uh, at least according to the registration, work in public libraries with, uh, with a scattering of kind of library educators, researchers, or consultants uh, from state libraries, LIS programs, um, and then a few others, but definitely mostly, mostly public librarians, which I'm really pleased to see. Um, and you all serve uh, a wide variety of communities. We have people who serve small towns, uh, rural America, urban, suburban. So I'm really, really pleased to see such a broad mixture of people. And hopefully we're seeing that also in the chat as people introduce themselves, that that uh, that diversity of perspectives that we, we bring to this conversation. Um, and just uh, before we get too far away, I um, just want to share two links. Uh, so we'll be using uh, throughout the event um, some opportunities to uh, share. Um, so we, we have our event Padlet that if you click on that link, um, you can uh, share kind of your takeaways uh, from, from the event um, in between the conversation. And we also have an event Jamboard, uh, which we'll be using a little bit later um, for a particular question. So the Padlet is a space for you to share what, what are you taking away from today's conversation? What questions do you have? Uh, and we'll, re we'll be returning to that information to make sure that we address your questions, um, if not today, uh, definitely in future sessions. So we want this to be interactive, engaging. If you're on any of the social medias, please use the hashtag relationship library. Um, 
and uh, and I'll talk more about the Jamboard uh, in a little bit. Um, so with that kind of housekeeping out of the way, uh, let's go ahead and just jump right in. Um, and I just want to start by by sharing a little bit of my story because uh, what what we'll talk about later is that um, uh, to really do uh, cultivate the relationship driven library, it really starts with you um, and how you tell your story in ways that kind of grab people's attention and make people want to work with you. <laughs> um, and so uh, I grew up uh, in a small town in Northwest Illinois. Um, I always kind of introduced myself as a rural American by telling people that um, I didn't realize until I went away for college uh, that you actually usually have to show a photo ID uh, to get money from the bank. Um, when I was a kid, I just go into the bank and people would give me money because they know who I was or they knew who my parents was were. And that's, that's kind of um, my kind of uh, rural background. Um, uh, but uh, some of my my passions are are trying to uh, cultivate more more cultures of inclusion, more cultures of collaboration uh, across uh, some of the lines of historical difference uh, that have uh, unfortunately been persistent uh, throughout uh, American history. Um, also very uh, big into running, bicycling, and and trying to create more more inclusive cultures for for active living. Um, and and generally healthy healthy lifestyles um um and and to really uh kind of pivot from who i am into what we're talking about today um my my big passion is really trying to figure out how can we ensure that the librarians uh, public librarians in particular are always represented um when we're talking about different sectors coming together to transform communities um and really, this this work uh, started for me um, when uh, former First Lady Michelle Obama's Let's Move campaign was starting to wrap up in 2016. Um, and these are just uh, some images from that. Uh, let's move active schools. Let's move museums and gardens, uh, which was part of the Institute uh, of Museum and Library Services. Um, and so uh, uh, former First Lady Michelle Obama, she really tried to think about how can we leverage the entirety of kind of our federal government uh, to promote uh, healthy living, um, in particular among children, um, but, but really for all ages. Um, and, and what I was really struck by kind of looking at Let's Move was uh, largely the conspicuous absence of libraries, uh, and in particular public librarians, which were uh, largely overlooked uh, and forgotten um, as a sector in society. Um, and I think the unfortunate reality is that's often the case. Librarians are, are typically overlooked. When we talk about communities coming together, um, uh, typically librarians are not part of the picture. Um, uh, we saw that in Let's Move. Uh, I've seen that in my research. Um, and therefore, uh, the task before us is to figure out how can we insert ourselves uh, in the, into the conversations uh, that are happening uh, across our communities and across America so that we're at the table um, and can bring uh, to bear our resources and expertise uh, to improve uh, community health. Um, um, and this is just uh, just a little bit of the background leading up uh, to uh, a study that was uh, funded by the Institute of Museum and Library Services uh, in 2020 called Healthy uh, Heal, Healthy Eating and Active Living at the Library via co-developed programs. Um, in which I had the opportunity to work with people in 18 communities across America, um, interviewing about 130 individuals, uh, roughly half of whom worked in public libraries, um, and roughly half of whom worked uh, in, in partner sectors, so non-library, people who didn't work in libraries, but worked with librarians around these initiatives. Um, and, and really the toolkit that I'll be sharing with you is a product of those interviews in which we really learned in kind of a 360 degree uh, view, how does it look like for public librarians to be part of community health? Uh, so it's not so much what librarians do by themselves, um, it's instead how librarians leverage and utilize the relationships that they have with others to, to make a difference. Um, and that's really what cultivating the relationship driven library is all about. Um, and the citations on the left were just some of the work that led led up to this project. Um, and just to kind of uh, take take a real quick uh, view from 10,000 feet um, before we jump into the toolkit, I think it's really important to just uh, just say where are we at uh, as, as public librarianship today? And I think I think the, the field of public librarianship is at a real crossroads. Um, 
Uh, and, and I think that the two directions that we, we face are, are in the one hand, kind of this, this impulse to, to go back to basics um, uh, as, as, we, as we are faced by threats to our intellectual freedom, uh, to our very existence. Um, there's a real impulse to say, uh, kind of circle the wagons and say libraries are, uh, as the IMLS uh, has recently said, uh, fundamentally um, about literacy. Um, and, and we make our, our stand on saying that uh, libraries are first and foremost ab about reading. Um, and uh, the most important place to challenge the gaps and divides in our country is with fundamental li literacy. So this repetition of fundamental, essential, uh, fundamental that we're seeing uh, in some of our national policy within the last year um, is really what I would call the back to basics approach, like librarians are going to take a stand around one particular thing and everything else is going to be kind of uh, pushed to the side. Um, but I, I actually argue that there's a, there's a completely different approach that we can use uh, to get ourselves uh, out of the troubles uh, and with, with which we find ourselves. Um, and that's really to, instead of circling the wagons and saying libraries are fundamentally about X, Y, or Z, to, to instead say that uh, the most fundamental attribute of the public library is that it is a part of a community. Um, and that community ultimately uh, decides and determines what that library is going to do. Um, and this this uh, this is really my kind of mantra, as a way, as it were. This came from um, uh, this report. Uh, libraries are great, mate, uh, but they could be better. Uh, released by the Australian government um, in 1975, um, and I won't uh, share the entire report with you, but I'd, I'd be happy to send it to you. I have it as a PDF. Um, but uh, the main thing is this question that they ask on page 17: What should the library do? There is nothing that a community cannot do in its library if it sees the need and allocates the necessary priority, provided the state and the Commonwealth give it the necessary support. Now, what a what a vision, what a national policy framework this is. Uh, and, and this is, and I think kind of just to go back, this is kind of we have this back to basics, let's circle the wagons, let's say we we do one thing really well. Um, or let's say that uh, the most fundamental thing about the library um, is the fact that it's part of a community. Um, and so just to reiterate, um, I'll, I'll just re read this again, because I think this quotation is so profound um, and so in, uh, impactful when you really think about it. What should the library do? There is nothing that a community cannot do in its library if it sees the need and allocates the necessary priority, provided the state and the Commonwealth give it the necessary support. And that's really the approach that we're going to talk about today when we talk about cultivating the relationship driven library. Uh, and in a minute, I'll talk you through our, our toolkit. Um, but uh, in essence, when we talk about kind of where, where, how do we get started doing something new in our libraries, um, it always uh, has to do with this confluence of need and interest, uh, which we call the seed. So there's a community need. But uh, there's also people interested in working on that need, and not just you. And this is really critical. It cannot just be librarians interested in working on it. You need to have other people in, in your community interested in working on it. Because if you don't have that, you don't have that necessary priority, and therefore you're not going to succeed. Um, and then finally, kind of uh, around all of that is that support, that that constant, constant need for advocacy and visibility. Um, because if you're not visible in your community, uh, you're not going to have the support that you need. Uh, to try new things and to do new things, um, and and to, so that's kind of a lot of abstract. Uh, let's let's talk through a few examples of how this actually looks uh, before we start going through our toolkit. Um, so I, I think a great example of this uh, pulled this from just uh, the headlines um, uh, in Iowa. Uh, the city of Humboldt, Iowa, recently received a fifty thousand dollar grant for healthy eating, active living. Um, uh, an institutional approach that can aid schools, workplace sites, and the community at large. Um, but this is kind of what's what's fascinating to me. Uh, if you read this article, it says that the implementation committees um, include uh, Director of Public Health, uh, the, the Parks and Recreation Director, Humboldt Public Library Director, Julie Larson, Economic Development, Schools. Um, and this is really what we're talking about. We're not talking about librarians starting new initiatives by themselves 
we're talking about how do we figure out uh, how do we get it <laughs> how do we kind of get get kind of on the ground floor and kind of working uh in these multi-sector efforts because it's really through being being visible and being present and being active um in these multi-sector committees uh and coalitions that's really where the rubber hits the road um and that's really where the magic happens um and it's not easy uh it's it's different uh than than what we usually talk about in libraries when we when we talk about services um, um, we're not talking about library services. We're talking about community services that involve librarians. Um, and that's a real important uh, distinction that I think we have to be clear about. Um, just another example, uh, Oakland, uh, California. Um, Oakland Public Library is a key piece in Oakland's bike plan. Um, uh, and here we have Associate Director Nina Lindsay discussing the role of Oakland Public Library in the Oakland Department of Transportation's 2019 uh, bike plan. Um, uh, during COVID-19, we saw lots of libraries kind of team up with others. Uh, for example, um, in Ohio, the Chillicothe and Ross County Library partnered with Ross County 211 or 211 uh, and area service organizations um, to help uh, by making friendly phone calls to check in on qualifying folks um, and by coordinating the delivery of essential supplies. Um, and again, uh, the most important thing here is that this is this is something I would never in a million years recommend the librarian try to do by themselves. Um, and in fact, uh, everything that I'm going to talk about is not something that a librarian can do by themselves. Um, it's about how, how do you find a way to do new things with your communities? Um, uh, just another example um, that we uh, documented in our research um, about how in Paducah, Kentucky, uh, the McCracken County Public Library worked with a local bike shop uh, to uh, have one of their uh, monthly bike rides uh, start and end um, at the local library um, in the process, uh, dramatically increasing the number of people and, and the diversity of people participating in this community bike ride. Um, um, and so they, the library uh, pedaled 990 miles um, and uh, did it a further 108 miles um, via their library book bike. Um, and, and I think also part of it is just thinking about uh, how the fact that librarians are such, uh, such trusted models. Um, and so we don't always talk about this when we talk about the book bike. Um, but the book bike is an extraordinarily powerful way uh, to demonstrate the, the fact uh, that uh, our streets uh, should be accessible to people, not only in automobiles, but by car uh, and bicycle. And we really heard this uh, in our research. So uh, the head of a Main Street organization in Michigan told us um, when the book bike comes, uh, people are reminded that we have a bike trail system that allows the library to come see us using their bike. Um, Having a librarian ride their book bikes, uh, they're wearing their gear, it really helps remind the public that everybody can be healthy. And I think this is really uh, starting from a place of power, starting from the perspective that you, you are powerful, you are uh, visible, you are a trusted person in your community. And when you do something, uh, people notice it um, and are inspired uh, to try, try doing that as well. Um, and, and I would argue, um, although, some may disagree with me um, that it's always been this way. There have always been librarians working collaboratively with their communities to promote community health. Um, so a great example um, is this, uh, this 1947 article in Library Journal, Libraries Attack Community Problems, um, in which they talk about uh, in, in Appalachia and Georgia, um, the, the bookmobile circulated not only books, um, it also circulated the county nurse. Uh, so you have kind of the, the precursor to our model, modern health department um, piggybacking on the library's book, book, bookmobile to provide uh, uh, essential primary services. Um, and this is the type of thing that really depends on relationships, that depends on partnerships. Um, and those relationships and partnerships don't just magically occur. Um, they take work. Um, and we're going to talk about what that work looks like. Um, but before we talk about what it does look like, um, I, I just want to really briefly talk about what it doesn't look like, um, because we saw during COVID-19 uh, a, a number of really ham-handed efforts to kind of uh, mobilize libraries um, as frontline uh, service uh, distributors uh, during the pandemic, often with, with very little um, 
very little buy-in from libraries, very little consultation with library workers. Um, and as a result, uh, things went uh, completely sideways. Um, um, so we saw headlines like Colorado to give out free KN95 masks at libraries, but programs rollout leads to confusion. Um, we saw uh, the Washington Post say the public library is the latest place to pick up a coronavirus test. Uh, librarians are overwhelmed. Um, so this is what it doesn't look like. Um, when you have people kind of just saying, oh, let's just distribute X, Y, and Z at the library without talking to you, <laughs> that's that's obviously not a relationship-driven library. Um, and so this is what we want to avoid, kind of just being voluntold to do things with no consultation or input. Um, and, and I think it really starts with, with being visible. Um, we, we can't do this work if we're not visible, if our labor is not visible. Um, and Rachel Ivy Clark has a great uh, article in American Libraries on this topic about how we make our labor visible. Um, but uh, I think it's really important to recognize that uh, we, we have a, a mountain to climb if we want to do this. Um, so OCLC and the American Library Association uh, in their report uh, from awareness to funding, voter perceptions and support of public libraries in 2018, um, they have some really sobering statistics about uh, the declining visibility of librarians and library workers um, in which uh, between 2008, 2008 and 2018, um, uh, the average American um, uh, thinks less of their librarian. Um, and so I think uh, people continue to love libraries, people continue to trust libraries. Um, but the thing that I think really matters is the visibility of the people who work in libraries. Um, and I think the statistics show us uh, we have a lot of work to do across the country. Uh, librarians and library workers are not visible, um, and they're not visible in a way that would actually lend itself to two partnerships and two relationships. Um, and so, so the question is, what do we do? What can we do about this, this reality? How do we get to a culture of collaboration um, in our communities? Um, and so again, just to reiterate, like I said, uh, what I'm going to be sharing um, is the, in part a result from interviews I did with uh, not only librarians, but YMCA, United Way, health departments, hospitals, um, nonprofits, uh, et cetera. Um, and, and to really uh, kind of boil down uh, what we found um, uh, as we talked with, um, with, with people from across the country about their experience working with librarians, um, we really found uh, again and again kind of this, this narrative arc um, before, before people had worked with librarians on a particular initiative. Um, in general, people love their libraries, but really had no idea what went on in libraries. <laughs> So they, they essentially saw libraries as book repositories, as the place to get books, as the place that has story time, as the place with book clubs and book borrowing. Um, um, after a little bit of time in education, um, people start to see the library as a trusted resource. Um, so we heard a lot uh, people saying the library is always there. The library is like Switzerland. Uh, it's neutral ground. Um, it's a space people turn to. It's stable and trusted. Um, and that leads to the idea, let's let's use the library as a physical space for health promotion. We see that in telemedicine. We see that in the big push to place social workers in libraries, uh, food distribution. And that's fine. Um, <laughs> there's nothing inherently wrong with that. But uh, I want to push things further because um, we found in a number of it, our interviews, um, the relationship went even further from the library as kind of this passive space uh, that just magically exists um, into libraries is really being where, where the action's at. Um, and in stage three, we heard in some communities uh, get to a tipping point um, where uh, things shifted from the library as a trusted resource uh, to the librarian is a critical community partner. Um, and the idea that we will work together with our librarian uh, to help figure out what we should do in our communities. Um, and I, I think we really have to keep pushing that because I think more and more people now see the library as that trusted resource. Um, but as we saw, that's that's kind. Of, this is what happens if we get stall out at stage two. Um, if we just have the library as a trusted resource, this this is the the inevitable reality that we're going to come to. Just this idea. Okay, let's have libraries distribute masks. Let's have libraries distribute uh, coronavirus tests. Let's have libraries distribute meals. Um, 
with no thought whatsoever to the, the workforce uh, and the labor that goes into that. Um, so we really want to talk about how do we how do we uh, communicate to everyone in our community that we, uh, the librarians, are trusted community partners. Um, and what stands in the way is really perceptions. Um, unless you are already working with health and social service organizations. Oh, really? Okay. You answer. Sorry about that. Unless you are already uh, working uh, with health and social service organizations, um, they do not think of you. And and when I say you, I mean you as an individual, um, you as a as a person. They may think of your library, uh, but they do not think of you. Um, and therefore, it's up to you uh, to plant the seed uh, that you are uh, a critical community partner that they want to work with. Um, um, and just to kind of illustrate that, uh, in one of the communities, uh, a branch manager told me um, almost the whole first year I participated in a health coalition. When we met, I was asked to explain why the library was there. What are you doing here? Like, you're not a member of the community care team. Uh, those were not the words. It was just that sort of questioning to which I said, oh, uh, we are. And, and you may have had similar experiences where people are like, why is the librarian involved in this, this effort to distribute food? Why is the librarian involved in this physical activity initiative? Why is the librarian involved um, in X, Y, and Z? Um, and, uh, and, and we hear this all the time, um, and I think it's really, really key. Um, and so to kind of demonstrate what we found, um, uh, people often ask librarians, uh, can you uh, distribute something for me? Can you host an event for me? Can you market something for me? Can you do something for me? Um, and, and what we really want to pivot to is how can we work together to get partners to ask themselves, how can we work together with you, the librarians and the library workers, um, so that we uh, together can figure out what to do. Um, and I think that the similar kind of thing happens among librarians. Um, so librarians often feel they have to ask, um, do I have space to do this new initiative? Do I have the budget to do this new initiative? Do I have the staff to do this new initiative? Can I do this? Um, uh, instead of asking, who can I work with? Who is out there in my community uh, that could help me uh, get something done, even if I don't have the space budget or staff uh, to do it uh, internally? Um, and that's really what uh, cultivating the relationship-driven library uh, looks like. Um, uh, I'm just going to jump ahead. Um, uh, and, and really, before I go into the steps, I, I want to really briefly share the story of Malagros Tanega. Uh, she is the branch manager of the Evelyn Metter Library in Seabrook, Texas. Um, and I think her story really encapsulates uh, everything that we heard in terms of this work being done uh, in the most effective way. Um, and so uh, Malagros had this idea, like we have this green space around our library. Uh, wouldn't it be awesome if we started a community garden? And so Malagros did not, uh, even though <laughs> you see her here with the shovel, like her, her next step was to not go outside with the shovel and start moving dirt around. Um, instead, um, she would start uh, just telling anyone who had listened, like, we want to start a community garden. Let's 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 figure out how we can do that. Um, so she'd go to the the as she went around the town and kind of saying, "Oh, sign up for your library card and canopy and and hoopla and this that and the other." <laughs> she'd also in her little introducing the library elevator pitch, um, she'd say, um, "Oh, and by the way, we we'd love to start a community garden. We have a great space for it." Um, and by planting that seed uh, in the community, um, uh, uh, people people listened and started thinking of the library in this way. Um, and at one of those meetings, uh, the city manager was in attendance. Um, and, and a week later, uh, the city manager was independently approached by a nonprofit um, that said, uh, this nonprofit told the city manager, wouldn't it be great if Seabrook, Texas had a, a, a community garden? And so the city manager said, uh, have you talked with your librarian? And the nonprofit is like, no. <laughs> like who, who in America first saw it as like, I want to start a community garden. I got to go talk with my librarian. No one, no one thinks of that. Uh, but because this librarian had planted that seed, 
because she had talked up the idea, the city manager was able to connect the nonprofit uh, with the library, and they were off to the races. They started meeting regularly. They came up with a business plan. Uh, they got a small grant. Um, they worked through all the bureaucratic hoops that they had to jump through. Um, uh, they started small with an herb garden, uh, then they expanded to a vegetable garden, uh, they kept growing to a fruit forest, a story walk, lending gardening supplies, um, and collaborating with an adjacent middle school, and it just keeps going. And, and But the main thing is this librarian, she had an idea, but she didn't do that idea. Like she, she waited until there was that con confluence of need and priority. Um, and 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 I think that's really key. We we need to stop jumping into things without uh, without having people uh, ready to work with us to bring it to fruition because um, that's 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 how the magic happens. Um, and that's kind of what our toolkit is organized around. Um, we start by planting the seed. Um, what what is the what are the confluence of needs and interests that we can see uh, uh, growing traction around? Um, uh, how do we find those seeds? How do we figure figure out where where is the best place to strike while the iron is hot? Um, how can we use these connections um, uh, to build new? And then, kind of after we get some get some people. Uh, in the case of uh, uh, Texas, uh, it was uh, the library and this nonprofit. Um, how do we nurture those seedlings? How do we protect them? How do we uh, uh, work together with our partners and with our relationships to move from an idea to reality? Um, how do we build and sustain trust? Um, um, and then uh, how do we harvest a bounty? How, and, and in this case, we're talking about documenting and celebrating what comes out of our, our collaborative labors so that people see the library as a critical community partner. Uh, so we're sharing our story to inspire and engage uh, other potential partners. Um, in the case of uh, uh, Seabrook, Texas, as I said, um, the initiative expanded to include a local middle school. So by being visible um, uh, you and, and celebrating the success, you, you inspire others. Um, and, and I think it's really critical and, and probably the most difficult part of this entire process um, is to carve out space uh, for time for rest and reflection and preparation. So really carving out the time to, to look backwards with your partners and ask, uh, how did things go? <laughs> yeah, what, how, did, ha, how have we worked together? Is, is this partnership one we want to continue? Um, do we want to sunset it? Is this a perennial or is this an annual? Um, uh, where do we want to go from here? Um, and creating space for that mindfulness sharing and planning is so, so critical. Um, and so I want to kind of uh, just uh, before I go a little bit uh, deeper into those steps, I, I want to just uh, really be clear about how a garden is different from a recipe and why that difference matters. Um, because often when I'm talking with librarians, I hear people say, just give me a recipe. I want to start a seed library. Give me a recipe. And I'm always like, there is no recipe. The recipe doesn't exist um, because the recipe implies that one person working in a controlled environment who has all the ingredients can follow those steps in a sequential fashion every single time and end up at the same result. Um, and the garden is completely different. <laughs> In the garden, uh, you are working in an uncontrolled environment. Uh, there's no guarantee of success. Uh, you're always dependent on externalities. Um, uh, there's always a time and a place. Uh, you can't uh, always grow everything every every time you want to. Um, and it's cyclical. You need to have time for rest, reflection, and harvesting. So I think we need to stop talking about recipes uh, and start talking about gardens, because that's a, a more accurate depiction of the work that librarians actually do. Um, and so let's 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 go through what does it look like to be a gardener, a cultivator of of relationships. Um, and yeah, Lisa, I, I, I absolutely patience. <laughs> you have to be very patient. There's a lot of time in which you're kind of just just waiting around. Um, that's that's another thing, which is um, another great uh, addition to wh why a garden is different from a recipe. Um, um, but we really think uh, things always start uh, here uh, in this confluence of need and interest. Um, so you have, uh, we, I, I think librarians are, are very good at, at thinking about community needs. So what is our community need um, and how can we address that need? Um, but what we're talking about is, is not, it's not enough to have identified a need. 
<laughs> you need to find people interested in working with you on addressing that need. Um, and that's the confluence of need and interest. Uh, okay, you have a need. Um, who else is interested in this topic and is ready to roll up their sleeves and work with you on 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 making a difference? Um, so so finding those seeds um, uh, and then nurturing uh, those seedlings. Um, and this is really about uh, uh, that that fraught uh, process of moving an idea to a reality. Um, and as Lisa pointed out in the chat, uh, it takes time. Uh, you have to be patient. Um, uh, your seedling uh, is so precious and vulnerable. Um, uh, there's a lot of time uh, spent building trust, uh, getting to know your partners, getting to know your relationships, maybe bringing in uh, additional partners. Um, uh, so that you have the right set of conditions um, uh, to successfully sprout your idea into something uh, big and bold and wonderful for you and for your community. Uh, step three uh, in our model um, is really thinking about uh, how do we how do we celebrate and document uh, the fruits of our labor. Um, and so this is kind of our, yeah, when you think of uh, the, the typical harvest cycle, um, uh, when, when it's time to kind of uh, harvest our, our bounty, uh, historically, people have had these harvest celebrations. Um, and I think we need to, we need to uh, uh, make similar traditions of celebration um, it, in which we set some time uh, with, with our relationships, with our partners to really, really uh, document um, what, what's coming from our labors, all the time that we've put in uh, to this work um, uh, so that we can uh, inspire others um, and also build more relationships um, around our library. Um, and this is also really critical. If you don't do this documentation work, um, you don't actually know uh, that your your bounty is, is nourishing those that need sustenance. Um, so you don't actually know and you can't communicate uh, the impacts that you're having um, if you don't take the time uh, to document um, uh, uh, your bounty. And then the, the last step uh, is, is what we call kind of looking backwards and looking forward, um, really focused on, on trying to understand uh, what just happened as you and your partners uh, uh, work together to start something new um, while simultaneously preparing uh, for, for the next cycle. Um, and as I shared uh, in the example of Seabrook, Texas, um, uh, there were kind of multiple iterations. They started with that herb garden uh, with a small grant um, and then built uh, into a vegetable garden. Um, then in the next cycle, they started uh, a fruit forest. Um, next cycle started some gardening equipment, uh, story walk, uh, bringing in middle schoolers. Um, but it didn't it didn't all happen all at once. Um, it, it unfolded over time in kind of a cyclical fashion in which um, uh, seeds were planted. Um, uh, those seedlings were nourished. Um, uh, they took the time to document and celebrate uh, their success uh, working together. Um, and then uh, figured out, okay, where 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 are we going next? Um, how did things work? Uh, do we need to fine tune our relationship? Um, do we need to clarify who does what? Um, how do we how do we kind of keep keep it going? Um, and and to kind of shift, because uh, I uh, one of the things that I really believe is that um, uh, uh, pictures and stories uh, are communicate volumes, uh, perhaps even more than kind of prescriptive advice. Um, and so I want to share another story uh, that we found uh, that I think really illustrates this process, but in a different way. So uh, the story that I shared you uh, about Milagros Tanega, that was an instance in which the librarian had the idea. Um, but uh, in Marion, Iowa, um, it, we had a case where the idea came from the partner, um, but in a very uh, interesting way. Uh, and I'll, I'll just kind of share the story and then I'll, I'll talk about it with you. Um, but to make a long story short, um, this is uh, Marion Public Library before COVID-19 um, uh, and, and continuing now, um, they had uh, and have uh, this Encore Cafe um, in which, uh, as you see here, uh, older adults uh, can come to the library uh, Monday and Friday um, and get a free hot meal. Um, uh, and, and how did they do this? Uh, why did they do this? <laughs> um, and so it really started, as things often do, from a conversation um, Around uh, 2015 or so, um, uh, the Marion Public Library was uh, uh, having a series of kind of strategic planning conversations 
focused on building a new library. So they they were in a position to think about, okay, we're going to build a new library. What do what does our community want this new library to look like? Um, and at one of those uh, planning calls, uh, someone from the Area Agency on Aging came um, and they said, uh, you know, Marion, you don't have a senior center. There is no senior center in Marion, Iowa. Can you all put a new senior center in the library? Um, and after some back and forth, they said, well, we probably can't do that. Uh, I mean, we'll have a bigger space, but it's not going to be big enough to have uh, a dedicated senior center in it. But let's let's figure out how we can work together. And what 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 does the area agency of aging actually need? Um, and through that back and forth dialogue, they found out that what the what the the aging agency actually wanted was just a space uh, that uh, they could have programs uh, for older adults, um, including what they call congregate meals. Uh, so they had funding from the federal government to provide what are called congregate meals and kind of the gerontology vernacular. And they were looking for a place to have those meals. Um, and they they never thought of the library. They thought, oh, if 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 this new library uh, sets up a senior center, we could start to use that that senior center in the library. Uh, but when the librarian heard that, she's like, wait, wait, wait. So all you need is a space? <laughs> we got you. <laughs> we have a meeting room. We want you to use our meeting room. Like, um, and, and so it was just that all that they had to do was let people know, like, this meeting room is here. It's for you. Um, let's figure out how we can do this. Um, but uh, like, like, like most people, like uh, the, the aging agency had never and probably would never in a million years uh, think of the library as a site for their congregate meal program. But as soon as the librarian said, yes, please use our meeting room, let's figure out how to do this, um, uh, they were off to the races in terms of actually figuring out the logistics. Um, it took the library very little labor. I mean, essentially on Mondays and Fridays, they had to set up the room and then tear down the room. Um, but uh, the partners and the aging agency, they had the funding. Uh, they had a local grocery store, hy V uh, that set up the food. Um, uh, as you see, this Encore staff, that's not a library employee. That's an employee of the partner agency. Um, but it also dramatically increased uh, the number of older adults that were coming to the libraries. Um, and for many, it became both a, both a, a meal program and a social lifeline. Um, people would come and hang out in the library, spend the day at the library. Um, uh, often the library would kind of do programming around the Encore Cafe. Um, but it, but but the, the main thing that I want to, it, it really started, again, where <laughs> I think it always starts with a conversation. And in this case, you had a, a community agency, the Area Agency on Aging, where it was beyond the pale for them to even think of the library as a congregate meal site. It wasn't until the librarian said, we have this space, let's do this. Um, it was only when the librarian said that, that things actually got going. Um, and what I think that this illustrates, even, even though it was actually the aging agency that had the idea, um, it was the librarian who had the plant, had, the librarian had to plant the seed that the librarian is a partner. Because like I said, to go back to where we started, um, if, if you are not already working with health and social service agencies, they do not think of you. I'm gonna repeat that. If you are not already working with health and social service agencies, they do not think of you. I guarantee that to be true. If someone if someone shows me uh, I'm wrong, uh, please, please let me know. I'd love to hear, hear about it. But, um, and by you, I do not mean your library. I mean, you as an individual, you uh, sitting, sitting wherever you are on this Zoom call, they do not think of you, uh, library and library worker. You are invisible to them until you plant the seed of you being a critical community partner. And so again, this uh, just to bring us back full circle then, so based, faced with this reality, um, so what are we gonna do uh, with all the problems that we're facing as a profession? Um, and, and I see kind of two pathways. We can, uh, if we choose to, really, really double down on kind of um, this back to basics approach. Uh, we're fundamentally about reading, uh, maybe information as well. Um, we can say this is our, our core and we're gonna circle the wagons and, and defend that core uh, to the exclusion of everything else. Um, or we could say, <laughs> libraries are about communities. We are part of communities and that's the defining attribute of a library um, and all success uh, emanates from that. Um, 
And so I'll read this quote a third time. Uh, what should the library do, according to this national report released in Australia in the mid 1970s? Um, there is nothing that a community cannot do in its library if it sees the need and allocates the necessary priority, provided the state uh, and the Commonwealth uh, give it the necessary support. Um, and so my last part is that uh, go out there, plant that seed, uh, be visible, uh, get out into your community, um, even if it's just uh, virtually getting out there, sending cold emails, uh, the digital equivalent of a cold cold call, um, and remind people, remind people that America's 17,000 plus public library locations, employing nearly uh, 145,000 individuals. Um, every single one of them uh, is a potential partner. So be visible, get out there, inspire, um, transform, uh, plant seeds. Um, and so join us in this journey. Um, uh, um, I'm going to put uh, a link uh, into our, our jam board for today, um, uh, but I'd love to hear uh, your, your thoughts. Uh, so as you think about kind of seeds that you may have planted in your community, um, what seeds have you planted? Um, what ideas um, have you planted? Or um, uh, what what ideas or seeds would you like to plant? Um, so you can, you can go to the Padlet um, and share there. Um, We'll also be using our, our chat uh, in a minute. Um, um, oh, I think I put the wrong link in. I apologize. Let me try that again. Oh, no, I didn't. Yeah, but go ahead to that, the, the Jamboard. Um, and I'll share a link to the Padlet in a minute. And the Padlet is really a space for sharing uh, in between. Um, uh, but as you're, as you're using uh, the Jamboard, um, uh, if you're just a quick uh, logistical thing, if you're interested in diving deeper into our toolkit, uh, which is now uh, available um, publicly online, um, uh, some of you indicated that you might be interested in doing a more formal uh, test. Um, we're going to be starting to do that in fall of 2023. Um, so be on the lookout for follow-up emails about being more formal participants um, in the trial of our toolkit. Um, but for now, we're kind of, it's it's available, it's out there. Just go to letsmoveinlibraries.org slash toolkit um, and send us your feedback. Um, I, I mean, like I said, we, we built this based on interviews we did uh, in 18 communities. Um, but uh, there's a lot of other communities uh, that were not consulted as we develop this toolkit. Um, so this is a really a living document, uh, and it really needs needs your input. Um, um, and so just to kind of look forward to uh, the rest of April, um, uh, <laughs> you could think of the rest of our conversation. There's really an essence. Uh, don't take my word for it. Uh, <laughs> hear 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 from the people actually doing doing the work uh, to hear how it looks uh, from from their perspective. Um, so this afternoon at 3 p.m. Eastern, uh, 12 p.m. Uh, um, Pacific, uh, we'll, we'll hear from urban perspectives in terms of what, what have uh, urban librarians been doing um, in Illinois, North Carolina, uh, and Maryland uh, to cultivate the relationship-driven library. Um, the next week, uh, we'll hear from uh, how directors and branch managers spark change uh, and get their staff uh, motivated, engaged, um, and getting involved in this work, uh, including Milagro Tanaka. Um, uh, it's going to be one of our speakers there. Um, then we're going to shift to small and rural perspectives um, uh, the third Thursday um, uh, with, uh, with Leah Wentworth and April Young from Kentucky, uh, North Carolina. Um, and then we're going to have our last conversation really with the methods to start where you are uh, featuring librarians um, who are very early in their careers uh, started doing this work. Um, and, and to really illustrate that you don't need to be a director to do this work. Um, if you work in a library, you can cultivate the relationship-driven library. Um, and we'll hear how librarians uh, in Texas, uh, Virginia, and Delaware um, get the ground running in terms of, of doing this work, uh, no matter what your job title is. Um, and then we'll wrap up. Um, uh, by really thinking about where do we go from here? How can we uh, really build uh, momentum around this? Because um, uh, I think what we really need to need is kind of a coalition of the willing. The more that, that we kind of pool our resources, the more we're able to communicate, um, not just locally, but nationally. Hey, this is what public librarians do. Um, join us, work with us. Let's figure out how we can work together um, to transform uh, America uh, in ways that I think America needs transforming. Um, and be vote, be bold. Um, uh, don't 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 be shy about what you can do. Um, 
And so uh, we're going to take a one hour break uh, starting at two, um, and then we'll be back at three. Just a, a quick housekeeping. We have one Zoom link uh, that we'll be using throughout the month of April. So you always will click on the same Zoom link uh, that brought you here to, to join our sessions. Um, and so, yeah, let me, uh, I'm going to thank you for your time. I'm going to shift really quickly to our Jamboard. Um, uh, and I'm going to, oh my gosh, so much stuff is in this Jamboard already. <laughs> uh, well, thank you for, for being so engaged. Um, um, uh, if you didn't get that link, um, I'm just going to pause. Um, I'm probably not going to be really great at kind of keeping up uh, with the chat. Uh, I see there's been a lot of stuff come in on the chat. Um, if you have uh, a question or comment, I'd encourage you now to, to really just unmute your mic. Um, uh, you all have uh, mic privileges. So if you have any questions or comments, go ahead um, and just unmute and, and let us know uh, what you're sitting with, uh, with with all of this information. But I'm going to stop talking and, <laughs> and, and so we can hear from you. Yeah, and, and while we're waiting, I'll just kind of read read some of the things that we're seeing. Uh, started mobile story walk program um, in conjunction with the city, training um, a facility library dog, working with the local urban farming org um, to promote healthy eating, partnering with graphic design courses, reached out to yoga and dance instructors. Yeah, this is this is awesome. And I love I love seeing all these examples. Um, and and as you all are kind of putting examples in and, and thinking about things, um, I, I would say kind of the the thing that kind of keeps me up at night, <laughs> as it were, um, is really thinking about. Uh, I mean, it's it's. I mean, the possibilities are are truly endless. Um, and so how do we how do we break down um, uh, that that uh, in a way that that seems like uh, you can you can take the first step. Um, I'm just going to move some things around so we have a little bit more room here. Yeah, and as you walk, let's see here. Sorry about that. Just trying to double. Oh, how did I miss the jam board? Yeah, yeah, Gene. Uh, absolutely. I'm gonna post a link uh, to this jam board um, here. Um, and as we move to the the end of our our kickoff session, um, I also wanted to uh, share a link uh, to to the Padlet. Um, so our Padlet, uh, we're hoping to be able to use. Uh, so uh, this is the space you can you can kind of. Uh, um, create kind of a longer reflection. So what questions um, are you taking away? Uh, what uh, what concerns uh, or issues do you imagine yourself confronting if you were trying to do some of the work that we discussed today? Um, and so it'll be kind of the Padlet, um, the Jamboard, uh, we will close um, and kind of lock down and it, it'll be a frozen document that we'll send to all of the registrants. So you all will get kind of um, a copy of this Jamboard that you can refer back to. Um, but that will, that will close after our opening. Uh, the Padlet is going to be a persistent space that we can kind of continue to uh, add to throughout uh, the month of April. But yeah, this is great. I love I love seeing uh, this this jam board really really fill up with uh, with amazing amazing things. Oh, and yeah, and I see Angelia uh, asks if uh, the PowerPoint will be available. Um, yep, uh, and oh, I see Amelia. Thanks, Amelia. <laughs> I should, uh, yeah, introduce uh, one of my graduate assistants, uh, Amelia Medrano, um, is in the chat. So thanks, Amelia, for for asking that. Um, Amelia, uh, were there any questions that I I missed uh, or comments uh, that you want to um, want to highlight? So I don't see any questions per se. I gathered a lot of information on what everybody's looking forward to um, learning over the next couple of weeks. So that's something to look forward and kind of where everybody is coming from. 
Great. Yeah. Thanks, Amelia. So I'm glad that people are excited. And yeah, I just <laughs> cleared out a little bit more room on the Jamboard because it looks like we're really maxing out our space. So, so keep those ideas coming. Um, yeah, it would be it would be an amazing kind of testament to, to the passion um, around this topic to really, really fill up this, this Jamboard. Um, so Sharita asks, how long will we have access to the Jamboard? Um, so you will have kind of uh, permanent access to the Jamboard as kind of a frozen document. Um, so just, just kind of a quick housekeeping. Um, my plan is throughout the month of April, um, uh, every Monday, I'm going to send uh, the recording of the previous week's event. Um, so Monday of next week, um, you will uh, receive kind of a, a copy of the Jamboard that will be persistently available. Um, you will also receive a link uh, to the video recording of uh, both this session uh, and our session starting at three uh, via YouTube um, uh, will send you kind of um, uh, some of the, the points uh, and any resources that may have been shared in the chat. Um, so basically, uh, any anything that happened today, we're gonna we're gonna try to the, to document and share with you. Um, um, yeah. But but largely just to make sure that uh, anything put in the Jamboard uh, isn't accidentally deleted <laughs> or kind of thrown away. Um, when this session ends, we're going to kind of lock down the Jamboard and freeze it. Um, so you'll be able to kind of go back to it and, and see what people have put in. Um, but we also don't want to have things kind of disappear. So we'll, we'll kind of be locking it down. Um, a little bit after two, uh, just to make sure we don't we don't accidentally lose um, any of, of the amazing content that you all have put in. Um, and we'll also go back and kind of clean things up just to make sure there's not kind of hidden posts uh, under underneath them. Um, and I'm just looking through to see. Um, oh, so and and um, do we have one on challenges librarians are facing? Yeah, um, uh, Angelia, that's that's a really great question. Um, and so I think I think you're right. Uh, and and I, I I think everyone knows librarians are facing uh, so many challenges today. Um, and and I think uh, what one thing that I I think uh, is that we we protect ourselves from challenges via our relationships. Um, and that really uh, came uh, to my forefront when I was at the Association for Rural and Small Libraries Conference uh, last September um, in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Um, I went to this amazing, amazing session um, led by Ashley Stewart, who's the library director um, at the Caseyville Library in Southern Illinois. Um, and in her session, uh, she talked about how her library was the first library in kind of rural Southern Illinois to do a drag queen story time. Um, and so uh, the audience was like, how, how did you do that? Like, I mean, librarians are being challenged all the time. How do you, how do you have the, the wherewithal to do something so big and bold like drag queen story time? Um, and her response was profound. Um, she told the audience, um, we have, we work with everyone in our community. We work with the mayor, we work with uh, the United Way, we work with businesses, we have a collaboration with our schools um, and the school social worker. So by, by taking the time to build up all of those relationships, when you have some random bozo coming to the library trying to pick a fight, uh, the, you, the, the librarian could say the mayor has our back, uh, the city council has our back, um, the, the librarian had really uh, done the due diligence in terms of building up the relationships, um, and that was the firewall against challenges, um, and I think that's a really profound, profound message, um, and I think it's also something we don't talk about nearly enough when we talk about kind of um, uh, the challenges that librarians face um, about uh, the real firewall against challenges um, is is our relationships. I, it is the people that we know and trust us um, and that we trust. Um, that's that's really how we protect ourselves against challenges. Um, so that's that's what I would say is that uh, yeah, relationships. Even if you're building relationships for one reason, you're going to find those relationships are going to bring you dividends um, in in uncounted ways. Um, um, and uh, oh, uh, sorry about that. I had a little pop up on my screen. Uh, but let me let me just uh, in the the minute that I have left, I'll just do a quick um, kind of segue um, to uh, our toolkit. Um, 
So I want to share uh, just uh, really quickly to entice you to go to the website um, and actually click on the toolkit. Um, uh, one of my favorite quotes uh, that I got from uh, one of the people um, that I interviewed, uh, give me one second here. So if I go to introduction, prepping the soil for, for the relationship driven library, um, uh, let me see if I can, of course now uh, I'm actually trying to do it. Um, and I can't find it, um, but yeah, let me just go to step one because um, there's one quote that uh, that we gathered from from a librarian that uh, is just so so profound. Well, now I can't find it, <laughs> but uh, I'll I'll, uh, I'll I'll go back and get it. But basically, the 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 gist of the the quotation from this librarian was um, uh, once you start kind of working collaboratively with communities. Um, uh, you're going to reap rewards exponentially greater than you could have possibly imagined. Like it, it really, it really becomes kind of a snowball effect um, in which you you thought you were working with someone to do X, uh, and it turns out you're doing Y, Z, and A, and um, and everything else. Um, and and I know we're we're at two here, so I'm sure some people have to go. But if folks are interested, I'll just share one final story before we before we break. Um, um, so uh, 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 one of my favorite stories uh, in Western North Carolina, um, uh, the Ash County Library started hosting a community blood drive. Um, but the way in which they started hosting a blood drive really illustrates everything that we're talking about. Um, so this library, uh, the story of how they became the host of the community blood drive, it started when the library started um, an oral history uh, event as part of the Library of Congress says, let's document oral histories of World War II veterans. Um, and so by getting involved in that oral history project, uh, they started building relationships with the American Legion and the VFW. And then they started talking with the veterans about like, what, what else are you seeing in your community? What else can we do together? And the veterans said, well, there's not really a space in our rural community to do a blood drive. Wouldn't it be awesome to do a blood drive at the library? And the librarians are like, yes, it would be awesome. <laughs> let's let's do that. Um, but it, it just uh, it really illustrates how uh, once you have those relationships, um, they're going to take you in directions you can't anticipate. Um, and that's that's part of the journey. Um, and with that, uh, I'm going to go ahead um, and stop the recording. Um, I hope uh, many of you will come back uh, in an hour when we have um, our first um, our first uh, uh, 